All right, well, this morning, I, I want to get into a, a, a message God laid on my heart earlier this week. I've been working on it all week called, Is God Love? Is God Love? And if he is love, what does that produce in our lives? What does that produce in our hearts? Is God love? I'm just going to pray one more time. Can't pray enough. Then we're going to get into the word together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. And Lord, as I was just sitting in that seat, and I just whispered over to Pastor Neil, I said, I feel a heaviness in this sanctuary. I feel a weightiness. I feel almost an oppression in this place. And Lord, what we've just walked through in this last week with what happened in this tragedy and these shootings and seeing what's taking place in our city, it almost seems like the enemy's just laughing. It almost seems as if he's taking ground and he's just laughing and he's left this place of oppression where we're all feeling it in our own spirits and even in our own hearts in the spiritual realms. But we are asking today, God, we are asking as I was looking out through my window the other day in the snowstorm and I saw the sun starting to pierce through the clouds. I saw the sun started to break through and said, the storm is over. The storm is coming to an end. The sun is coming out. We are asking the same would begin this morning, God, that you would pierce through the darkness. You would pierce through the oppression. You would come, Lord God, as captain of the host of your army, and you would fight like in the day of Daniel when Michael came and said, I fought with the prince of Persia, but I'm here now. That you would fight against every oppression in this place and in this city. And you would break through, we ask. You would break through and you would speak to our hearts this morning, I pray. God, give life. Let these words, Lord God, not be my words. Let these words not just be a teaching from a pulpit. We're tired of that. Let it be a declaration of the things the Holy Spirit will do here today. Let it be a declaration that God is in this house to do something in our midst supernatural. Let it be a place of proclamation, not a place of teaching, we ask. God, we pray for the supernatural this morning. God, give me grace. I'm tired. I'm sick. I had a hard time really putting together in clarity what you want to say. I have it in my heart, but in the clarity of my mind, it's been difficult. But I pray, Holy Spirit, you would clarify it. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would come and you would make sense of it. You would put everything in a divine order as we get into your word this morning. And I am asking you wouldn't just speak to me, but you would speak to every person sitting in these seats that we would hear the voice of God. We would hear God's voice, not a man's voice. Open hearts, speak to lives, bring hope where there's no hope, conviction where there's needed. Give faith, Lord God. Let faith burst into hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And you can leave it open on your lap. We're going to read from verse 34 down. Normally when I get to speak, excuse me because I just spilled a bunch of water everywhere. When I get to come and I get to share, I always talk about my family. My family. I guess it's because I miss them. They're back in New Jersey. I'm here in Colorado. And it's my way of kind of keeping touch and just letting you guys know how great they are. How much I miss them at home. Um, but I grew up, I grew up in a home of all engineers, I was an artist growing up with engineers, so imagine what that was like. A-type personalities all through the home. My father thought it was a game to see how close he could park the cars in the garage because he just wanted to see the exact, the exactness of how close he can get them. He was just, it was the way he was created. It was the way his mind works. And he, he himself was a civil engineer. He did site development, he did commercial real estate and grading a property and put all types of sewer systems and water. He was an engineer and, and he always desired that me and my brother would be engineers. It was always passed down. We want you to follow in your father's footsteps. So our lives from a very young age was already mapped out for me and my brother. We were already getting math tutors. We always had science tutors, elementary school, high school, all the way through. And as we entered into college, what did we do? Well, me and my brother just took engineering science courses. We, we said, well, we engineers. That's what dad did. That's what the family did. That's what we're going to do. My brother, he was brilliant. He, he just demolished science and math. I mean, he did differential equations, and he was into all this. He loved it. He, he went through high school and through college, and he got his master's degree in mechanical engineering. He started working for the Defense Department, engineering different weaponry for our armed forces. He went on to start getting his doctorate. He was just like, he was like a whiz kid. He just, he just fell into the line easily. Me, on the other hand, not so much. <laughs> 
I took a little bit of a different route. I did the nine-year program at school and throughout college. Yeah, I was a like, nine years, amen. And, and at the end of my nine years, no masters, no engineering, I, I ended with school with a bachelor's in fine art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I feel so much better about myself this morning because really the degree does nothing for you. It's, it's like, it's nothing. But I did it because I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a starving artist living in the middle of New York and showing shows and galleries at Chelsea. And it was kind of my dream. And I went a totally different route. And even though it's been many years that I've walked through and I'm, I'm not a starving artist anymore, God grabbed me and, and put me here at this church and, and all the things have kind of unfolded, there's always been in my heart an appreciation for the mathematical disciplines and the sciences used in engineering. I'm no good at it, but I appreciate it. I, I, I look around and I see what these types of, of careers and what these types of occupations have, have bettered our whole society, our whole culture. I, I look around and it's amazing the things we as humanity are able to do because of engineers. I think for me, one of my, my most admired of all the fields of engineering. One of the things in our government that I admire the most is our space exploration department, NASA. I mean, it's, ama it's amazing the things that they're doing, the things that they're seeing. You look at these rovers and, and these things they're sending to Mars and, and how complex and, and how much in the disciplines of math and science you need to do these types of orbits and, and it's unbelievable. You think about one of the greatest feats ever. What was one of the greatest feats we ever did as a country, as a nation? We landed a man on the moon. NASA put a man on the moon, Neil Armstrong. We all know the story. We read it in the textbooks. We go over it. We study it. We all remember the moon landing. And we all remember the name Neil Armstrong. But not many of us Remember the name General Charles M. Duke. He was the 10th person that ever walked on the moon. He was launched in the Apollo 16 missions in 1972. And when he came back from his mission, he had reporters and interviews. And there was this one reporter who asked him this very strange question. This was the question the reporter asked. He said, did you have any free time on the moon to do your own scientific experiments? Things that you wanted to explore that NASA did not send you there for. He looked up, and with the sternest face, he looked at the reporter, and he said this. He started explaining the intricacies of a launch like that. He started explaining how everything was put in such an order that it was done down to the millisecond. That them and as a crew, they had to follow mission control, and they had to push buttons at certain seconds to get them with the boosters and the thrust and everything they needed to land perfectly right there on the moon. He said, you had to be so disciplined. You had to watch everything. You had to make sure that you were going through all the protocols if you wanted to land and you wanted to make it. And this is what he said. We did it so well that we actually landed heavy. We landed with extra fuel to burn. The reporter asked, well, how much fuel? This is what he said. Listen to this. 60 seconds of extra fuel. 60 seconds. Could you imagine if anybody just decided to do their own thing? Could you imagine Mission Control saying, well, now you got to push this, and they're thinking, well, I'm drinking a coffee. You, you 60 seconds. That's all you had. And that's with you doing everything right and even better than right. Could you imagine if they were drinking the coffee? Do you imagine if they said Mission Control, whoa, whoa, wait a second, we just need a moment to ourselves? Could you imagine? Everything you trained for, everything you signed up for, your whole life that you committed to, you lose out. You miss the experience of being one of 10 others that get a walk on that thing. You miss out on the view. You miss out on seeing everything. You miss out in experiencing everything that you got involved with this, this organization for. You, you lose it. I know this sounds really weird and really strange because this is how my mind thinks. But I think loving Jesus is a lot 
like being a NASA pilot landing on the moon. I know you guys think that's weird, but we're going to put it together this morning as we get into the scriptures. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, where we're going to begin. Matthew chapter 22, I'm going to read verse 35, and we're going to go all the way down to 40 together. It says, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. Jesus was used to having questions asked of him. His whole ministry, if you, if you pay attention, you go through all the Gospels, there's two things you'll see in his ministry, miracles and questions. There were so many different religious sects of the day, and people would ask him everything and anything. They would talk to him about fasting. They would talk to him about prayer. They would ask him about marriage. They would ask him about the resurrection. They would, they would ask questions about where he received his authority. He was constantly being questioned. It wasn't strange for Jesus to have somebody always asking him something about what he was doing. But for me, and you have to hear this, out of all the questions that were asked, out of all the things that people came forward and said, Jesus, would you answer this? I think for me, this is one of the most important questions ever asked of anybody. The question was, which of all the commandments is the greatest? Which one would you say is the great commandments? And it's interesting because when you get into the text, when you actually go into the Greek, that word which, when he says which one, it's not quantitative. It's, it's not the Pharisee saying, put it in order. Show me which one. No, no, no. It's actually a qualitative term. In other words, the lawyer, the Pharisee is saying, I know which one's the great commandment. We all know what's the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But what is at the core of that commandment? How does it work? How does it live in me? How does it affect humanity? How do we walk it out in our daily lives? It was a qualitative issue. It's so amazing to me that we as Christians who have been filled with the Holy Spirit and be given, the scripture says, a new heart, and God actually writes his commandments into our hearts. We, we all were born again. Don't we all have a desire to love God? Is it not our desire? Is it not your desire? It was put in you. Don't you desire with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, don't you want to be completely engulfed with him? Don't you want to live solely for him? That, that was given to you as a gift by the Holy Spirit. We all have that desire. We all have it put into our hearts and our lives. But the thing is, like this lawyer was asking the question, I think for a lot of us, we're saying, well, how does it exactly all work? How do, how do I actually do it? How do I live it out? How do I give my whole mind to God? How do I give my whole heart to God? How do I give my whole soul to God? How does every part of who I am completely be his? There's a question in all of us. And I, I think if I went around and we had lunch and I could take every one of you out to lunch this afternoon and I sat down with you and I said, do you love the Lord your God with all your mind? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart? Do you love the Lord your God with all your soul? Could you honestly look me straight in the face and say, yes? He's got my finances. He's got my marriage. He's got my future. He says jump, and I say how high because I just want to serve him. I mean, honestly, could you honestly look me straight in the face? Could any of us in this place truly say yes? I mean, isn't that what we do here at church? Aren't we here Sunday morning to spur each other on, to encourage each other, to pick up ones who have made mistakes and have failed and said, brush that off, God loves you, continue on in the journey? Don't we have small groups and community groups so that we could talk and we can encourage so that all our minds, our hearts, and our souls might be committed to Christ? I mean, is that not discipleship? But How? 
how does that command actually become a reality? Turn me to 1 John chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. 1 John chapter 4. I'll do this my best to bring this out the way God showed me. 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to read verse 16 through 19. And it says this. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been made perfect in love. We love, listen to this, because he first loved us. Isn't that interesting? The Bible makes a direct correlation with our love, with his love. They said it's the revelation of his love that causes your love to go back to him. He says there's a complete dependency. If you don't grow in the revelation of who he is, if you don't grow in the revelation of his love, if you don't grow in the revelation of how great, how sovereign, how he's with you, how he'll never forsake you, how all things work together for good, if you don't see that through the eyes of your heart, through the work of the Holy Spirit, your love for him will be diminished. It's his love. It all begins with him. Matthew 13, 44. Pastor Neil loves this scripture. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. It was the discovery of the treasure that compelled the man to give up everything. It was the discovery of something in the ground that he didn't know was there, but was open to him. And when he saw it, he said, this is of such value that all this other stuff means absolutely nothing. Give me the treasure. Let all my mind, all my soul, all my heart be committed to this. Have you ever been in a church service where the Holy Spirit just shows up? You ever been at home just reading your word or even just taking a walk? Do you know I've had times where I've just been walking. I'm not even doing things spiritual and the Holy Spirit just shows up. And he starts opening up your heart to who God is. You start, it, I, I can't explain it, right? None of us can sit down and actually explain this. We can say God is sovereign, right? But it's a whole other thing when the Holy Spirit shares it with our heart. When we see how big he is, when he see how vast he is and that he loves us. That he's not mad when we make mistakes. You ever fail God so bad you thought it was all over? You came to a church service, the Holy Spirit showed up and said, no, 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 that's forgiven. Keep walking with me. You ever experienced that? I've been in cars where I've been driving and God's presence would come down so strong I had to pull off. I had to get into a parking lot and fall flat on my face. And say, this is amazing. You are amazing. You are Unbelievable. And what does it do when you get those revelations? You automatically, right at that moment, what begins to happen? You have to worship. You got to lift up your hands. You got to sing. You got to start sharing Jesus. You got, it just gets into your spirit, doesn't it? Something of him gets into us, and then we begin sharing it back to who he is. Pastor Neil, I remember when I got saved in your office in Times Square Church. Holy Spirit came down. I heard the gospel message like you couldn't believe. I've heard it so many times. But in that meeting, Holy Spirit showed up. He began showing me his forgiveness. He began showing me his mercy. Let me tell you something. I walked from 51st Street and Broadway to 23rd Street in New York singing on the top of my lungs. I didn't even know worship. I had my phone. I'm calling people. I'm calling friends. I'm calling. Let me tell you about this. This is amazing. They're all saying, well, we told you about it. No, 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 no. It really happened to me. There was a joy. And in New York, you could do it because everybody's nuts. Everybody's singing. There's crazies everywhere. You could just shout. You could dance. Nobody cares. I was reading an article on Yahoo News. Interesting article of a woman in China. I can't pronounce her name, so don't ask me. 
But the article was about how she wears her wedding dress every day. Every day. For 10 years since she's been married. She wears her wedding dress. The woman looks like a loon. I'll be honest. When you look at the pictures and you read the article, you think she's nuts. She's crazy. And then you start reading her story. That at the age of 18, she was kidnapped and she was taken to a local village where she was sold into slavery to an elderly man. He kept her for 15 years out in the fields. He said, you will glean my fields. You will care for my crops. That's exactly what happened. For 15 years, he treated her harshly, abused her, ripped her apart. 15 years, she gets away. She finds an escape, and she goes to another village, and there's a woman there who begins to care for her, takes her into the house. Says, you can stay here. I'll hide you. I'll care for you. I'll provide for you. That woman had a brother. The brother was kinder than the woman. She fell in love with the brother. The brother finally proposed. And this is what she said. Listen to what she said. It's amazing. She said, my wedding day was the happiest day of my life. And I never wanted it to end. And that was when I decided I wanted to not only keep my wedding dress, but actually bought four other wedding dresses as well. She says, I don't care what people say about me. My wedding dresses are part of my life, and I will continue to wear them regardless. When you get a picture of how other God is, when you realize he's not like anybody else, but he's so amazing, so vast, so great, let me tell you something, you will never take your wedding garment off. You will walk around proudly saying, I belong to him. Listen to me, young people. You're worried about school and all the things going on. You can't stand up in front of your own peer pressures and and, and your teachers. Let me tell you, you ask the Holy Spirit to give you a glimpse of the God you serve, and you will stand up proudly. You will stand up and say, let me tell you about the God. I'm putting on my wedding garment. Nobody's taking it off. You'll wear it every day. You're having trouble in your home. You're having trouble with a spouse who's constantly abusing or being rude or whatever it is. I'm not talking physical abuse, but but just a disconnect. And you're not connected and you're even thinking of the word divorce. Let me tell you, get a picture of him. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and show you who he is. Ask him to meet you at church services and open up your eyes one more time to reveal his vastness and how other he is. And I'm telling you, you will put that wedding garment on. You'll say, I'll stay in this marriage. God wants me to be committed. I'll follow it all the way to the end. You will find that all those burdens will fall right off your neck. You can't love God without knowing his love for you. It's not possible. Listen to me. You can fear God. You can be reverent to God. You can be religious to God. But you cannot love him. It's only the revelation of his love that spurs our love for him. So here's the question, and this is my whole point this morning. This is what I really want to get to. And I'm going to connect moon landings, wedding dresses, the love of God, all of it's coming together through this last passage. If that's true, and I can only love him by growing in my knowledge of him, how then do I grow in knowing his love? How then do I grow in the knowledge of who he is? I'm going to give you one word word the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and it's not a popular word in our pulpits anymore. It's not a popular word in our churches because we've taken the word and we put a yoke of condemnation on it, and there's no such thing. But the word is this. You can only grow in your knowledge of him through obedience. It's obedience that unlocks the revelation of who he is. Well, how? Well, I'll give you a perfect example. God is not a hard taskmaster, the scripture says. That means everything that he commands in our life, everything that he's leading us into is because he's loving and he's kind. Which means if you follow it and you obey it, you see him work miracles in your life. Right? How can you watch God provide for you if you won't go where he's leading, right? How can you watch his protection for you if you're not willing to go what he says? How can you know that it's better to do what he says and to follow his lead and to trust in him if you don't take the first step of faith? The reality is we don't have any deeper revelations of God because we will not obey him. We will not take the step of faith and say, I believe he's good. I believe he's God. And I'm going to follow what he asks no matter how stern it sounds. 
we have to be careful in this generation that we don't take the grace of God and suddenly say, well, now that you have grace, you just don't have to obey. That is stupidity in all of its measures. Grace is there for forgiveness. Grace is there for mercy. Grace is there to break condemnation. But it's to continue on in the journey. It's to continue on in the things that he's calling us to do that we might know him better. First John tells us God is what? What is God? Oh, he is? Do you believe that? You do? Then obey him. Take the faith and believe that he's love and do what he says. Even the sternest things, like I said, come from a heart of kindness and love. When God deals with you, when the conviction comes through the Holy Spirit, when he speaks to you from the word, and he says, stop lying to your spouse. When he says, give more to missions. I want to see your life be given more to the things of God. And he starts provoking. When he says, get on a short-term mission trip because I want you to give a little more of yourself. When he says, call up that person that's struggling. Don't go to bed tonight. Call them up. Talk with them. Pray with them. When he says, lay down that relationship, that friendship that's corrupting your soul. That flirting with that woman that's not yet adultery, but it's real close. Shut that down, God says. Even the sternest things that he speaks into our lives is not the voice of some policeman saying, get it right or I will jail you. It's the voice of a loving father with a broken heart that says, walk it out because I care for you. I remember, I remember being in New York City and... God woke me up. He gave me a vision. It was the only vision I think I've ever had. He gave me a vision in my room, woke me up from sleep, and spoke to me. And I had this picture. I had this picture. It was me sitting at a bar. And I had all my artist friends around me, all these people that I thought were big shots, and big stuff, bands, and all this junk. And I had a girl, a blonde-haired girl around my arm. And I'm, I'm, I'm drinking. I'm drinking tequila. And I'm, I'm getting drunk. I'm getting sloshed. And I had this vision of me just in this bar. And I heard weeping. I heard weeping in the bar. And I looked under the, the table, the bar stool. I looked under. And underneath there was Jesus. And he's weeping. And he spoke to me. He says, I'm not mad at you. I'm not angry. I'm weeping and broken because everything you think you're going to get from that, I want to give to you and you won't take it. It's not a voice of a police officer. It's a voice of a father who cares. Jesus said this. Think about this. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I think you could turn that whole verse around and you wouldn't do it any damage. If you obey me and keep my commandments, you will love me. If you see who I am by allowing me to lead you, you will fall head over heels with me. And we in the church, we're not to bring condemnation. We're not to bring judgment to people. But let me tell you something. We're to encourage each other. Go on with God. Obey him. Put that friendship down. Everyone says, you're so legalistic. You're so judgmental. Shut up. Just shut up. I care about you, and I'm the only one who's telling you that you're getting the wrong. Shut it down. Find the grace by God. Pray together. Come to my office. I'll seek God for you. But let's find the strength to take that step of faith and to obey God. Let me, let me try to end this because we're closing. I'll give you one more thing that God put on my heart. And it, I'm going to be honest, it's heavy. I'm going to give you meat. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to treat you like children. I'm going to tell you honestly. I'm going to tell you honestly the way it is. Matthew chapter 24, you could turn there. We're going to read verse 1 through 13 together. And I want to just share with you one thing on my heart. This came from my conversation with Pastor Neil. So if you don't like it, you meet him after service. And you tell him it's your fault for telling Michael that stuff. But we're going to jump in. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 through, actually verse 3. We'll go from 3 down to 13. 
It says, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many, listen to this, many will fall away and betray one another, and hate one another. Let me tell you something. That's in the church as well as in the world. That is in the church. And many false prophets will arise and lead many away. And because lawlessness or wickedness will be increased, the love of many will grow what? Cold. Pretty heavy. Jesus is saying this in our day, in our age. He's saying there's going to be all types of wars and rumors of wars. Listen, guys, turn on the news. Turn on the, this is a mess. We got Iran possibly getting nuclear weapons soon. I'm not taking any side. I'm not saying Republican or Democrat. I'm saying we're all screwed up. I'm saying every party's an absolute mess. If you're looking for your government officials to fix this, forget it. It, Washington is done. It is done. We got ISIS running all over the place. They're bombing. We got fear on all sides that the new polls are. Are you scared of terrorism? It's an absolute yes, even in our country at this point. We got mass shootings happening on college campuses, at schools, all over our movie theaters, now downtown. And you say, well, it doesn't happen that often. We just had one last month. Listen to me. The hand of God is lifting off of this nation. You don't need to be a prophet to see it. Things are spiraling out of control. The the restraint that was on people has been lost. There's anger everywhere. There's protests happening on all college campuses. Everybody's upset about nothing. We are spiraling. And this is what the scripture says. Not only the world is going to start spiraling, but in the church. He says there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be betrayal. There's going to be division. Don't tell me none of you haven't experienced anything because I've talked with all of you and most of you in these seats, we could be honest, about one step away from not going to church ever again. We're saying, I'm done with this. I'm sick of going from one church after another church after another church after another church and dealing with the junk I'm dealing in the church, let alone in the world. I was supposed to come in here and get refreshed. I was supposed to find peace. I was supposed to find friendship and grace. And I'm telling you, things are going to get even worse. It's not because of this leader or that leader. It's just the reality of the day we live in. And God says this, Jesus says this, because of all the wickedness and the issues in the church and everything spiraling out of control, there's going to come such frustration into my people, such exhaustion from dealing with the issues, that their love, their love is going to grow cold. You know what that really means at the end? That means the ability to fulfill the calling that God has on your life gets stopped. You can't serve God without loving him. You can't do what he wants without loving him. Listen to me. Many of you are wondering why God's hand is so heavy on you. Why he's dealing so sternly about certain things. Could be how your finances are going. Could be you cheating on taxes. I don't know. And God's hand won't lift from you. You come here and you've tried this whole message of hyper grace junk and it ain't working. It isn't lifting the hand of God off your life. And you're wondering why. Listen to me because God knows what's coming. And if he can't get you to obey now, he can't reveal who he is. And if he can't reveal who he is, your love, listen to me, will not remain. It won't make it. Oh, that's doomsday preaching. That's the reality of the day we live in. You got to get over that. That's not holy Pentecostalism. That isn't just being, oh, he's a, that, that ain't prophecy or nothing. That's in, the, that's in the headlines. That's in the news. Pick up a Times. Pick up a news, Newsweek. Wake up. 
God is dealing with you. He's dealing with your marriage, the way you treat your wife. He's dealing with the compulsive lying. He, he could be dealing with the excess of drinking. He could be dealing with, oh, no, 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 I got, no, no. No, listen to me. If he's dealing with that, all I can say is take the step of faith and obey him. Obey him. Because through that obedience, you will see the love that commanded the command. Through the obedience, you see who he really is. Otherwise, your love for him is always diminished. And the things that are coming, you're not going to stand. The reason this whole last part of this message came about, Pastor Neil, my good friend, Pastor Neil was traveling with Nolene, and they came back, and they were flying back into the States, and the Lord spoke to him. And I, I agree. It, it bared witness with me when you shared with me. I went home, and I prayed. And he said this. He said, all over the world, God's doing different things in different nations. You, you could see his hand working. And there's all different problems in different churches and different cultures and different people. But he said, the thing I saw that God showed me on my way home as I was flying in was that the issue with America is that we're still eating off the old reaping. We're not re-sowing in our churches. We're eating off the heritage we've had for 40, 50 years. We're eating off prayer meetings, can I be honest, that happened in the Great Awakening. And you know what? We're not praying anymore corporately. We're not investing into our churches and our lives. It's too difficult. It's too much time. It's too much trouble, right? We've gotten lazy. We've embraced messages that says, I don't have to obey anymore. And what's happening is we're not re-sowing. We're not putting back in for another reaping in the generations to come. And that's why you're seeing the nation in the mess that it is. God is saying to you this morning, it's time to sow. It's time to start obeying my voice. If you don't have the strength, then get some prayer teams around you. Get some accountability, some men who stand with you. Not to condemn you, but say, let's take this journey together. It's time to sow back into our lives, into our marriages, that we might reap another harvest. Stand with me this morning. I am going to give an altar call, and it might be only for a few, because I'll be honest, this type of message destroys your pride. You can't have pride to answer this message. <laughs> you got to be honest. There's a twofold altar call that God put on my heart, honestly. Some of you are hearing exactly what God's saying, that there is a conviction in your life that you're not obeying. His hand is on your life. He's dealing with you. It could be your attitude. could be unforgiveness. could be an issue of unforgiveness you haven't released. could be a bitterness, whatever it is. It could be a gossiping time. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to go into all the Holy Spirit knows and you know. You didn't come into this place just for me to tell you what it is. You already know God's been dealing with you. And today, this morning... If you say, yeah, I have an issue, but I need strength to obey. I, I need a deposit of the Holy Spirit to give me the faith to step out and to believe that God is loving. To believe that what he's asking will ultimately end in my good. I, I'm going to be honest. I need it. I need it. I feel, I told my wife, we've been in prayer together. I said, I feel God's calling us to something. and He's going to ask something that's going to be big very soon. It's coming. Even Pastor Neil, again, he had a, 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 just sitting with me, and he said, I'm going through some things in my own life. I'm in transition. God's leading me, but it's for you. It's for you. I'm depositing faith in you through these experiences. And I believe in my heart, and can I be honest? I need prayer right now. I'm saying, God, I need faith that when the time comes, I would believe that your heart is good, that you really are love, and I will step out, and I will obey you. I will step out, and I will believe you. I will step out and say, yes, God, and in that, get a deeper revelation of who you are and have my heart stirred up more for the things of God. If that's you this morning and you need prayer for that, you need a, you need a stirring of faith by the Holy Spirit, I'm going to invite you to come up to this altar. I want to pray with you. I want to pray together. I want to, I'm going to step down myself. And secondly, this is the second part of the altar call God gave me. If you're confused... 
You feel like God's speaking to you, but you don't really know. And there's like this confusion in your mind. The enemy is confusing you. You can't get clarity on the situation. But you say, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss what God's calling me to do. If you need clarity so that you know what God is speaking, would you come up also? I want to pray with you also. I want to ask God that he would give clarity to us this morning, that he would touch our minds and show us if we're missing anything, if we've fallen out anywhere with him, if if we're missing a, a place of his will and of his calling. Come up. Don't even be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. I'm up here. I, I like coming down here. I love being down. This is where I this is where I hang out. Listen to me. If our churches don't turn into prayer meetings, we ain't gonna make it anymore. We ain't gonna, we gotta pray. We gotta start praying together. I'm gonna ask the worship team to lead. If there's prayer ministry anywhere, if you're at the altar, that's fine. If you're not, you can lay hands. Community group leaders, if you just lay a hand on someone's shoulder and you just begin praying for them, begin lifting up. You know what, guys? Why don't we do this this morning too? Why don't we ask for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why don't we ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us again, to give us a renewed love, to give us a renewed vision of God? Let's pray. I'm gonna pray for that. We're gonna worship. We're gonna ask for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. God, we pray right now. God, we ask, we need something from heaven in this place. We need something from heaven in our hearts. And we're asking right now for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, God. We can't obey you without it. We can't stir our faith up and take those steps without it, God. I am asking for every individual in this place. I am asking for every person up at this altar that you would baptize them afresh with the Holy Spirit. You would touch them afresh with the Holy Ghost. You would give a renewing, God, and giftings in life, Lord God. You would fill hearts one more time with the working of the Holy Spirit, God. God, stir up our faith to obey you. Stir up our faith to listen to you. Stir up our faith to walk it out. We don't want to miss it, God. We don't want to miss it like Duke, General Duke. We don't want to miss mission control and not get to land on the moon. Not get to see the things that you want to show us. Not get to experience the things you want us to experience, God. Holy Spirit, I pray for every person up here who feels like they failed one too many times and feel like your invitation to come and obey has been lost. I pray you would break that in the mind right now in the name of Jesus Christ. You would break that in the mind. They would know it's not too late, that as long as they have breath in their lungs, that you are a God that's for them, you are a God that's with them, that you can restore all things that the canker worm has eaten. Touch them, Lord. Worship team, you lead us just in one course. We're going to have five more minutes of prayer. This one I'm going to ask. If you're up here, ask. Ask for a touch of the Holy Spirit. Ask for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to start laying hands. We're going to start laying hands. Pastor Neil, would you help Adam? Where's Pastor Adam? Would he help also? Lay hands. And then start praying for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit this morning. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we thank you this morning for your ministry. We're not looking to run out. We're looking to wait here as long as it takes. God, I'm not afraid to sit. We're not afraid to sit. We don't want to rush you anymore, God. We don't want to do our schedules anymore in church. We want to look at you and say, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? What are you doing? And God, I pray for a fresh filling of every person in this place. I pray for everybody that's hungry and asking that you would fill them, God fill them. I've been praying this prayer over every individual. Get rid of the old wine, God. Get rid of the unbelief, Lord God. Get rid of it. Shatter the unbelief and fill them with a new faith. Fill each person at this altar with a new faith, with a fresh faith, a faith that believes that you're good, a faith that believes that it's worth obeying God in everything he asks, a faith that believes that I'm not hearing the voice of a police officer, but I'm a loving father. God, give faith Give faith now, God. Clear out that old wine. God, prepare us. Prepare us for what's coming. We're sowing into the earth. We're sowing into the kingdom. Prepare us, God. Prepare our families, Lord. And I pray, God, as Dale spoke to me earlier, that people will know, God, that it's safe in your arms. It's safe, God. That coming to you even in our failures, coming to you in our weaknesses, renewing our faith in you, bringing all of our pain, all of our struggles, it's safe. As everything in this world is dangerous and filled with terror, in your arms, it is safe. It is safe. Obeying you is safe. Holy Spirit, we thank you. God, continue ministering. God, we ask, 
can I just pray this prayer? I'm not, I'm not looking to leave. I'm not looking to run out those doors. Can I just pray this prayer? God, we pray for healing in this place. Holy Spirit, we're, we want healing again. God, we want healing in our altars. God, is there something in this altar? Would you heal it, God? Would you heal it through the touch of your Holy Spirit? Would you heal any sickness? Would you heal any disease, God? Would you heal things and bring glory to your name one more time? God, we pray for those who are addicted. We pray for those addicted to pornography, drugs, and drinking. God, break the addiction now in the mind. We shouldn't have to wait years on end. Break it now with one touch of the Holy Spirit. Break addiction, God. Break it, God. Heal marriage is God. Holy Spirit, we ask for this. God, we give this all into your hands. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.